So we'll, we'll continue with our discussion of Orange County. We were talking about the issues here, no clear lines of responsibility, lack of oversight, site, pressure for yield, and then just uh, Citron himself, his arrogance because of his prior success, whether that was luck or skill, remember the one thing he was doing was betting on rates falling, which they had done uh, for a whole decade. So was that skill or was that luck? Um, and because of his success, they gave him more more freedom. It's somewhat like my when I was at USA, they let me do options and swaps without any constraints whatsoever. It was pretty amazing, but it's because I'd had a pretty good run there, and they just assumed, well, it's Ron, he'll do okay. You, you never do that. They don't know if my run was luck or skill, and who knows what will happen in the future. You see that type of thing happening at AIG and uh, Merrill Lynch back in 2008. You just never give someone more freedom because they've been successful. In fact, success may actually be a, an indicator of a uh, looming uh, disaster. His his demeanor was somewhat suspicious because he could not take criticism. He would brag in front of the board. Rather than reporting his strategy performance, he would just say, look how good, I've, how well I've done. Uh, that's it's tough not to do that. Um, there's times I would have success through entirely due to luck, and boy, you definitely don't want to say that. But boy, it'd be much better for your career if you can find a way to say, "Yeah, this this worked out really well for us, but it was entirely luck." I, I mentioned the um, the swap that we did with USA that went up 500 million dollars. To say that was skill, there's no way any of us would have ever predicted that. That was a one a one in a thousand year. Uh, kind of just gift. Um, there's no way any of us could argue. I don't think the the uh, board that we reported to would have ever believed it either. It's just too too freaky of a of a collection of events. So we're just very very lucky. Citron would take that and say, "No, it wasn't luck. It was skill. I know what's going on here." Uh, he was prickly, secretive, controlling, decisive, arrogant. If this is your first boss, you quit. So let me tell you, your first boss should, first of all, scare the life out of you, but not because they're prickly, secretive, controlling, and decisive, and arrogant, but because they know so much it scares the life out of you. It's their knowledge that scares them. My first boss's boss in finance scared the life out of me. He was a very aggressive type A type of personality. He was a PhD. He was a finance professor, did a lot of editing of finance and economics textbooks, brilliant guy. He scared me to death. Perfect boss. That's what you want for your first boss. Scary to death. But he was not prickly, secretive, controlling. He was, he could be mean. He could jump on my case. But he was always, his first goal was to teach. He wanted me to learn. And he would be on my case to learn. Why don't you understand this? Go back and do it again. But he was always focused on me becoming a better employee. Citron, not like that at all. Citron was prickly, secretive, and controlling because he didn't know what he's doing. And if you have a boss like that, you have to quit and go somewhere else. That will not help your career. So since he was gambling and he was successful, he, so he keeps doubling down. Uh, and then in 93, he was asked why interest rates would go remain low. And he says, I'm one of the largest investors in America. And that's a typo there. I don't know why I haven't fixed that yet. Largest investors in America. <clears throat> I know these things. No one knows where interest rates are going. Anyone that tells you, I made a lot of money because I knew rates were going to fall. Um, we talked about that, some of that with Annie Duke, and that's that that hindsight bias. We see it. We buy a stock, it goes at 20%, and we say, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Well, no, we didn't. <laughs> it happened. We might have had an inkling it could happen. It could have been our 53% case. If we really did our homework, maybe we're 55% case. And then it happens to say, I knew that was going to happen. That's never the case. No one ever knows what's going to happen with markets. So there's a lot of indications here. This is the worst case scenario for a boss for you to work for in your first job. And then you add on top of all that arrogance, his lack of skills. He didn't know what he was doing. He had no college degree, had no background. He was doing these new transactions that no one had ever done before. He was getting ripped off left and right by Merrill Lynch. And... You could tell he didn't know what he's talking about because he couldn't clearly explain what he was doing. 
I never trusted anyone who said they knew what they were talking about, but they couldn't explain what they were doing. We had a CEO at USA, Bob Davis. He, he had this exact same opinion. His view was, I know I'm a smart guy, and if you can't explain it so I can understand it, it's not because I'm stupid. It's because you don't really understand it. I love that attitude with him. If I came in with something and it was I was getting too technical, he would tell me to explain it again. And if I couldn't explain it in a way that someone as brilliant as he was could understand it, I obviously didn't really understand it. Um, CR, CMRA, I've talked about this firm, Leslie Rawl, brilliant, brilliant person. She walks in and she said she was surprised that for a portfolio as large as this portfolio and for the reputation he had, and he had a good reputation, she was shocked at how unsophisticated he was. Again, he wasn't doing any value at risk. I think value at risk is the key to this case. If he'd run some simple value at risk, he would have seen the incredible risks he was taking. The risk did not come forward because rates kept falling and falling and falling. Um, so he talked about his contingency plan. So listen to this contingency plan. He says, all managers have plans for changing in changes in interest rates. You can't make plans for worst case scenario. Why not? <laughs> Of course you can make plans for that because if you did you would have to sacrifice opportunity to earn a good return yeah I mean there's so much wrong with that statement everything you've learned in finance uh, tells you you've always got to think about the worst case scenario uh, because if you can't handle the downside you've got to take some risk off the table but his idea was I know rates are gonna fall so there's no reason for me to anyway hedge that scenario it's gonna happen so he was a little too cocky uh, he says it's our job to assess the most likely interest rate risk. That's absolutely true, and make plans accordingly. That's absolutely true. Then he says I can't discuss the specifics of my contingency plans. Why? Well, he says it's because a manager's strength is to not let others know what their plans are. But his true contingency plan was he had no plan. His entire plan was the bet on interest rates falling. That was his entire plan. He had no other plan besides that. Not only that, but he got into stuff that was way out of his league. He said, I'm the one who wrote the legislation to make these types of investment possible. So he's bragging that he got these new, quite complex securities approved. But it wasn't the instrument he created itself. It was his uninformed use of it. So he created an inverse floater. So inverse floater. Now floater, if you think about a floater, those of you taking John Tui's class, maybe you've talked about floaters yet. A floater is a bond whose interest rate changes anytime interest rates change. Often it's priced off of, of, off of LIBOR or off um, you know, some, some floating rate. And, and I realize LIBOR is going away. That's an interesting thing we've talked about earlier in the class. So if LIBOR is 3%, you get 3%. If LIBOR jumps up to 4%, you make 4%. That's a floater. It has a duration essentially of zero because it always always responds to interest rates. So its price never changes. That's a, that's a floater. An inverse floater is this thing here. It pays you a fixed rate minus LIBOR. Very, very, very different. So when LIBOR rises, you get less. And the really thing you got to ask is what if LIBOR goes above 8%? With a floater, you assume the floating rate can, can't go below zero. Maybe it's possible. Uh, I don't think LIBOR has gone below zero, but I'd have to check that. But you know, is it, it, it's, it's highly unlikely you would actually have a negative return on a floater. But an inverse floater can be set up such that you can actually lose money. A lot of them will have caps, so that the worst you can do is make zero. But that, that's going to reduce your return a little bit. But, but think about this. Why is it the duration of this thing? The duration is very, very high. This is, this is a levered bet on interest rates falling. Because if interest rates fall, you make more money. Interest rates rise, you're going to lose money. And not the only do you lose money because instead of getting 5%, you're not getting 4% if LIBOR rises from 3 to 4 But also the price of the security, underlying security, will be repriced. And that underlying security will drop dramatically in price. He was betting on a recent past. We do that a lot in finance. Uh, interest rates have been falling for quite some time. And he levered it up. So you should be able to do the math on this. So Merrill Lynch sent Citron a warning. That actually, Merrill Lynch was starting to get worried, not just worried about Orange County and them losing money. They were probably getting worried that Orange County was going to sue Merrill Lynch for getting Citron into these securities. Merrill Lynch made a lot of money off of this by setting this all up for Citron. 
And then they try to talk him out of it because I could tell he was in over his head. But he, he refused to back down. But he should have, he had a maturity of 1.4 years, but because of these reverse inverse floaters, his actual duration was seven years. And we'll talk about the math that you can do on that. We'll come down to the math here and talk about how you can use that seven year duration. Another mistake he made was he focused entirely on credit risk. That was all he was worried about. And that's what money market funds usually worry about because most of them have a zero duration. They have no duration at all because most of them are floating rate. So they're not worried about interest rates because they're not taking any interest rate risk. So their entire risk, and it's usually not a lot of risk. They don't take tremendous credit risk, but it usually is a risk that they watch out for. There was one hedge fund. I should have looked up the numbers. I don't remember the numbers in 2008. Let me put it on pause and see if I can find that fund. So here's, here's the fund. It's called the Reserve Primary Fund. It's one of the oldest funds and one of the largest funds in the U.S. at the time in 2008. And... Um, so it broke what we call broke the buck. It's very rare for money market funds to actually lose money. And this fund had never lost money until 2008, but it had Lehman in its uh, portfolio, and that made up 1.2% of its portfolio. So the fund share dropped from a dollar to 97 cents. So it essentially lost 3%. Now think about it, it lost 3%. Uh, the fund was dissolved and paid out, you know, almost back to a dollar. But it lost three cents, three percent. Now think in ninety in two thousand eight, the stock market lost you know fifty percent from peak to trough. Here's a money market account losing three cents. That's the that's the mentality you want to think about with um, with um, with Citron in Orange County. Orange County, this fund he was running was a money market account. It was not supposed to lose money. And think about one of the worst runs on a money market in history. One of the worst. Disasters front and money market was in 2008, and this particular fund lost three cents, three percent. And so we're going to see with Orange County, the losses were more like 15 percent. So yeah, you you see why this was such a why he made such huge mistakes. And so you can see with that uh, that particular fund, this reserve primary fund, their entire risk was credit risk. And Citron had credit risk down. He only bought government securities or AAA rated securities, uh, although Fannie Mae obviously uh, has had some problems since 2000, 2007. But at that time, very high quality, not much risk at all of, of credit default. But it was very risky related to interest rate risk. Um, it was also risky related to liquidity risk because remember, he's doing this new security no one's ever done before. It's complex, it required very complex math to determine its underlying market values. It was going, if, if this thing started blowing up, it was going to be very difficult for him to sell that. Um, his portfolio was loaded up with highly correlated risks. Again, everything was betting on interest rates falling. If interest rates rose, everything in his portfolio was gonna start crashing. So, you know, that's why I gave you that universal risk. Um, well, I, you know, you need to know price risk, interest rate risk, liquidity risk, credit risk, currency risk, inflation risk. You need to go through each one of those and think about extreme scenarios and what it means for your portfolio. He didn't do that. He assumed that all of his losses were paper losses. I hate that term, paper losses. I remember a high school teacher telling me how he was teaching his students about the stock market. And he said, as long as you never sell the stock, you don't lose anything. Those are just paper losses. And I, I didn't tell him how much I disagree with him. But if the, what you own drops 30%, guess what? You lost 30%. Until you can convince the market that your your, your portfolio is worth a dollar and not 70 cents, you, you, you lost 30%. The market's telling you something. The market's pretty wise. It doesn't drop 30% for no reason at all. It drops 30% because it's what it thinks those future cash flows are worth in today's dollars. Um, and, but he said, these are paper losses. Don't worry about it. Paper losses. As long as we don't sell, we're fine. As interest rates kept rising, he kept trying to cover these losses by doing what? Well, he doubled down. We're going to see that same thing with long-term capital management. Doubling down is a great strategy. If you go to Vegas and you keep doubling down, you will leave with a fortune. So bet a hundred dollars and lose it. Then bet $200. If you lose it, then bet $400. 
then bet 800, then 1600, then 3200, 6400. Just keep doing that, going and going and going. Eventually, you'll win and you'll double double your money. Just keep keep doubling down. So bet 3200 bucks so that you either make lose 100 percent or you make make 100 percent. Doubling down always wins unless you run out of money. And that was his problem is he kept doubling down and it was causing him huge losses and he eventually ran out of steam. He just couldn't go any further. Um, <clears throat> so inadequate risk measurement and reporting, I think this is key to the case, is no value at risk. This is such an obvious value at risk case. Um, he didn't use such things. He didn't he didn't know about them. He'd never been trained on them. Um, Citron even wrote, we're not required to report paper gains or losses, but you should always report gains and losses. And you should also report values at risk. What happens if this happens? He should have told the board, hey, I think rates are going to fall. This is what my positions are. However, if interest rates were the rise, this is what we would look like. Exactly what we did in our balance sheet immunization, a plus 100, plus 200, plus 300. So even forget valued risk, he could have just run stress tests. Even simpler, just run a stress test. But he didn't do that. You always report paper losses and gains because, and I always had this debate at USAA because there was a lot of people at USAA that said bonds always mature at par. So why do we care if the bond price is down 20%? And my, my argument was, yeah, you might hold it to maturity. You might get your par back. It doesn't default. But don't you want to ask the question, why does the bond market suddenly hate the bonds that you own? Aren't these some pretty smart people? Why are they driving that price down so low? I want to at least ask the question, why does the bond market not like my portfolio? He didn't do that. So interest rates rose sharply in 1994. I've actually got a graph of that I can show you. You can see here's 93. He's doing great. He's betting on rates falling. He's got those reverse uh, inverse floaters. And then here's the election. He wins this election. And then 94 happens. And you can see a sharp rise, essentially a 250 basis points rise in interest rates in a very, very short period of time. Now, if he just held on, they would have been okay. They, they, they actually locked in some of these losses. If they could have just waited it out, they would have been fine, but, but they, they couldn't. And so they ended up cancel, you know, locking in a lot of losses up here. So, you know, it was a temporary thing. Essentially the story is, and I don't know, I can't remember the exact details, but Greenspan for some reason got really worried about inflation so he pushed up interest rates really fast, one of the fastest that the Federal Reserve has actually ever pushed up interest rates. The entire curve went up, all interest rates rose, and so he had these huge losses. <clears throat> um, so he lost $1.5 billion. So think about it. His duration was seven years, and rates rose 2.5%. You can do the math, right? Minus duration times the change in rates. So you got minus seven times 0 0.025. And you can certainly do the math on that. Minus seven times 0 0.025. It's minus 17 and a half percent. They lost 1.5 billion on a, I forgot if it's seven or seven and a half Seven and a half portfolio, seven and a half billion dollar portfolio. So you take 1.5 divided by 7.5, and you get you get 20 percent. So he lost 20 percent. Just doing the stress test we did using his duration would have predicted a 250 base point rise. He would have lost 17 and a half percent. Instead, he lost 20 percent. Not a bad, not a bad forecast. So just basic stuff. You know, you think, wow, I'm undergraduate. I'm taking this this elective risk management. Sur surely I wouldn't be able to walk in and, and do, radically show someone who's been in the business for 30 years with a seven billion dollar portfolio. Surely I couldn't tell him how to do his job. But yeah, you could have. You could have stepped in with Orange County and you could have saved that county a tremendous, tremendous loss. All right, so there's Orange County. In the next session, we'll start with long-term capital management and probably finish up, probably take us a couple of sessions to get through long-term capital management.